So uh, the topic that uh, we'll be talking about is uh, deep learning in the browser. I think I should stand probably Bhargav this side. Yeah. Um, I we'll just do a quick introduction. Uh, my name is Amit Kapoor, um, and I primarily kind of work in the intersection of data, visuals, and stories. So I'm in primarily interested in looking at the world from a data lens, uh, trying to understand it through visualizations. Uh, and hopefully telling good stories about it, right? Uh, so I, I do this both as kind of teaching uh, people around uh, on this domain as well as uh, helping startups and consulting on projects related to uh, companies willing to adopt a data-driven lens, right? So that's a little bit about myself. Hey, uh, hi, everyone. Um Welcome to today's session. Uh, my name is Bhargav. My background is in machine learning and deep learning. I am currently building a product which is focused on personalization, targeted for content-rich businesses like media and content marketing. OK. Um, so uh, this is, in sense of a topic, it's kind of really um, something that's really developing at the moment in terms of how each of these two domains kind of fit in, right? So uh, people that are trying to do deep learning and people who are trying to do it in the browser, right? Though these things are fairly evolving and moving targets at the moment. And um, this is just some thoughts and ideas on how we can use this uh, in our own work, right? Um, so I kind of teach. So one of the things that, is, uh, that I think about is what is a learning paradigm that people can adopt when they look at new topics, or how can they think about these topics uh, and learn something about it, right? So in the learning paradigm, how does this uh, doing deep learning in the uh, browser really helps us, right? And I know we, we kind of talk about AI a lot, but for me, uh, when I, I kind of don't use the word AI too much, uh, I really think of it as kind of how can we augment intelligence in terms of helping people do something that they're already doing, right? Um, um, so I, I, in, in one way, I'm kind of a really trying to say, where does the human come into the loop of this whole uh, data science process or, uh, or AI process, whatever you want to say, the deep learning process? And how can we help the human in that loop to understand better, right? To, to understand better, or to create better, or to build something better. Um, so the, the talk is going to be using these three different lenses to do it. So if you're a user, and you want to use this uh, to do something, or you're a creator, or a creative person, and you want to use deep learning to create something, or at the end, you really want to build something, and and, uh, and make something using that tool, or make a tool that other people can use to do it, right? So the three lenses that we're going to adopt is users, creators, and builders, and, or, or if I was to simplify it, people who are trying to learn this. As a user, I want to understand what's really happening. Uh, creators are people trying to play with this. So how are we trying to play and build some, uh, play and create something with it? And uh, builders are really trying to create something, right? So learn, play, create, right? Um, how many are familiar here with deep learning in that a conceptual level? OK. Not bad. Uh, how many are familiar uh, with the browser? <laughs> OK, browser in terms of doing deep learning in the browser? One, OK. Uh, so very few people, right? Uh, and how many are familiar with, let's just say, um, um, one of the tools to access the browser in terms of, let's say, the JavaScript ecosystem to do it? Um, OK, a few more hands kind of go up there, right? Um, so that's kind of one of the challenges um, in, in the browser, really, right? I mean, uh, I teach deep learning, uh, and <laughs> To a large extent, we use a lot of ecosystem which is uh, heavily into the scripting languages like Python or R, or if you're doing larger data in terms of Scala or the Java ecosystem to do it, right? And in the browser, really kind of brings up these questions. Uh, 
of, uh, you know, is this even really possible when I talk to uh, a lot of my uh, practitioner friends uh, who are trying to do this, right? Uh, the other pushback that I get um, when I've done this talk uh, earlier is uh, people say, why are we talking about UI, right? Uh, so the association with the, the JS or the JavaScript ecosystem is it's really the front end. And uh, what we're trying to build here is really uh, connect these two and make make a possibility of how to do that, right? Does that make sense? Okay. So, why to do it in the browser? These are my three reasons uh, in terms of thinking about this, right? Um, one, it allows everyone immediate access to it. So if it's really running in the browser, even without a server at the end, I can immediately access what I'm building, right? So I can reduce this friction between connecting with the end product to what the user is doing. So I have an immediate connection. I can reduce that friction and hopefully reach a wider audience than maybe um, the coding driven, set up your own stack, do everything kind of the world that we, we are at the moment, right? So how do we expand this audience that is there to get access to this, right? Um, is that context helpful? Yeah? Um, so historically, it's been really hard to do this stuff, right? If anybody's done, tried to do any machine learning or uh, deep learning or just playing with data in, in the browser, it's really been hard, right? Uh, most of the machine learning libraries are not that well developed. Uh, they don't really access the GPU on your computer. So the only GPU you have uh, is the GPU used to drive your display, and we, we need some way to access that. Right? So historically, they've all been CPU-based um, libraries, and they're not really good at numerical operations that are really key into the <coughs> key in terms of doing a lot of the matrix stuff that we do, right? Um, also, there is an ecosystem thing, right? So we need uh, we don't we just don't need to do data science or matrix multiplication on the, in the browser, we also need the supporting ecosystem to get data inside it, uh, to be able to visualize it in an easy way, uh, to be able to create something, to be able to run what you are using, any kind of reactive environments like notebooks in the same way that they are. So there's a lot of ecosystem that is required to do it before we can raise. So this has historically been a big challenge. Uh, and uh, it's, now changing. So the biggest change uh, at the moment is really uh, in terms of WebGL accelerated learning frameworks, right? So the way on, one way to access uh, the GPU is on the browser. If anyone has done um, a little bit of um, or seen any of the 3D models being rendered, they're all using what is called WebGL. And now we have a, the same WebGL 3D graphics engine that drives your rendering available for us to do a lot of the matrix computation that we would be able to do uh, on, a, on a GPU that's on the server, right? So this WebGL accelerated frameworks is really what kind of allows us to really um, start doing this. So that's the first big change. And this is really <coughs> happening right now. So um, I teach, uh, for example, Keras uh, and uh, you can actually right now use any of these libraries like keras.js, which will uh, take the model that you're running uh, and use it for inference on the browser, right? So if you're using keras, there's an option. Even I think mxnet has a JS option, right? But yeah, so mxnet, so some of these libraries already have their JS equivalents that you can use to drive inference, right? Um, there's also uh, framework agnostic Libraries like WebDNN, uh, which are also faster and can support a wider set of frameworks. So if you're only looking at model inference, these are the two options that you can do. Uh, but hopefully we want to go beyond just model inference, right? So at some point you may even want to have a way to access and really train if you can, or at least do transfer learning on the browser itself, right? So then you need a, a library that can actually access it. And both TensorFlow um, has a JS equivalent, which is, emerged recently, um, really, really new. And there is also an, uh, an MIT project on TensorFire or MIT X2, 
students or ex MIT students project and ten, called TensorFlow, which is also trying to do the same thing, right? Uh, so we we have a set of uh, Webflow WebGL accelerated learning frameworks that we can then start to see about and uh, use in the browser itself, right? So what does this mean? Okay. So that's just if you're not familiar with this landscape, this is what the current landscape looks like for doing it. So let's go back to our three questions. How do we how do we do the three things uh, that we talked about? How do we learn, play, and create in the browser? Right? So how do we learn? We learn as a user by creating something called uh, by either by doing it or by allowing the user to actually explore it. So I want to provide a user as a way to explore something and understand what's really happening. So this whole concept by explorable explanation is. Uh, based on this idea that I can provide an interface for someone to play with the data itself, or play with the algorithm itself, or play with the data model itself, right? So, it's really how do I get people to learn by active learning? And this active learning is not the active learning in machine learning. This is the active learning of the user actually engaging with the model itself and learning, right? Um, make sense? Okay. So let's look at how we can help. As a, uh, I'm a teacher or uh, I'm an explainer, and all of us are explainers in this context of AI. When somebody comes to you and say why the model is doing what it is doing right now, or why is this algorithm giving me this output, I want to find a way to explain people how this thing is working. So I want to help them build intuition around what's really happening with my deep learning models or with my interactions, right? So I can build intuition at three levels, right? So let's see some examples of that. Um, I can help them build intuition at the algorithmic level. So what is really happening at the algorithmic level? I can help them build intuition on what is happening at the data level. And then I can help them build intuition at the interaction of both of these, which is the algorithm and the data itself, or let's say data models, right? So how does the model, once trained on the data, gives me a model, I want to see the interaction of the data with the model, right? So there is these three layers of abstraction that I'm really trying to help people build intuition on, right? Uh, yeah, does that make sense? Okay, so here's one example, um, which is uh, not so much right now in the uh, deep learning context, but this is a beautiful article by Mike Bostock on understanding and visualizing algorithms. Right? And these algorithms could be as simple as trying to explain to people what quicksort or mudsort is, or more complex, like how does a depth first search happen or a breadth first search happen to reach a solution. Right? And it's a very good analogy for deep learning because um, you know, when we do randomized search or we do uh, focus search uh, or Bayesian optimization, we're really trying to f find a way to get to an optimal solution uh, without really uh, exploring the entire space that is there, right? So how, thinking about how we can visualize the search space is one way to think about how to visualize algorithms, right? So what surface area of my uh, possible uh, space has the algorithm really searched, right? So this is a good metaphor for kind of, it, and these are all examples that run in the browser. So uh, um, the links are there, but I'm just kind of uh, walking through some of them to show the possibilities that is there, right? Um, so uh, some of the initial examples, um, Andre Karpati, who created Cognet, did you anybody has seen this or played with Cognet? Okay, Andre Karpati uh, is a f image researcher from Stanford, one of the very nice notes on 231N Stanford course, if anybody's done. And um, uh, he's now director of AI at S Tesla. And in 2000, or uh, so early part of this decade, 2010 and all, he created some of the initial libraries, uh, which was really, uh, which was really looking at what is the space that, um, which is really looking at what what is my space and what are the different layers really learning at each level, right? So this is a simple visualization to say, can I look at uh, different activation functions, different uh, initialization functions, 
different architectures. And it, it was a very small library, but this is what kind of 2014 is when it came out, right? So this is a, there are some nice demos if you really want to look at uh, how algorithms really work, right? Um, so in 2016, we had the algorithm neural network, which if, if anybody plays with TensorFlow, they may have seen this playground on TensorFlow. This was kind of a small port of this covenant.js uh, library uh, written to really visualize pretty much all we do in deep learning, at least in the solution sp space, right? So changing with learning rate, changing with activation, changing with regularization, changing with the number of hidden layers, and given some simple inputs and data, what does the output space look like, right? A uh, really helpful tool to help people understand the basic visualization or the basic algorithmic design that is there. Um, is it just playground? Uh, it's called playground on TensorFlow. It's playground.tensorflow.com or .js. Um, um, yeah, if you just search playground TensorFlow, you'll get that, or the link will be there for uh, all. The, all of those are links that you can actually act, reach and uh, experiment and play on your own. I'll show a few uh, um, actual when we start kind of looking at coding it. Um, so this is what really happens. Uh, you can change the parameters, and as the epoch start going on, you can start to see, uh, given this architecture, what's the output, right? So it's a very simple neural network that you can make. You can add layers to it, uh, and you're constrained by the type of data, but uh, you can play around with learning rate, activation, regularization, regularization rates, and a type of problem, regression, classification. Uh, if I think about the two days I teach TensorFlow, <laughs> or deep learning, this is pretty much what we, the search space of what we try to learn. Uh, obviously in more deeper on each of these questions, but we're really trying to get people to build intuition on how these algorithms are really working and doing, right? Uh, so Tinker with Neural Network. This is 2016, it is not using any of the libraries that I just talked about. It was just a custom library based on covenant.js that was run, right? Okay. Uh, this is, uh, this is now using tensorflow.js. Um, um, and um, this is actually a live uh, notebook, and we'll come to that when we start to create it. And trying to show the same concept of what's really happening in a neural network, right? So I'm really trying to uh, fit a curve an to an arbitrary set of points. And um, this whole concept of universal approximation uh, in the sense of how a neural network can approximate any function which is kind of the basis of why uh, neural networks are so powerful. And uh, it's just a GIF right now, but um, you can change the number of iterations and see how you kind of fit with it. So this is what was done on a browser-based UI earlier, now being done in a very notebook-like environment, which we'll come to see later on. Um, and you can actually code this pretty simply, pretty quickly to do that. Um, so that's kind of the algorithmic level. You also need some tools that run on the browser to look at the data, right? Um, so a, a few things that really help in the in the uh, let's say in the data space is uh, if you have multi-dimensional data, how can I look and facet it and look at all possible visualizations uh, of how the data looks like? Especially if you have tabular data. So I want to play with this really quickly. So you know, facet dive is uh, one way to kind of do that. It's a, this is one way of visualization, which is a unit visualization. I'm visualizing each possible element. And the possible element here is a data row. But if you had an image data set, you could actually visualize each image in the same space and see how uh, images are changing based on classes or what once you've done the prediction, how do they uh, map back again into, uh, let's say, a confusion matrix uh, and kind of replicate that, right? We also sometimes want to look at data uh, in, a, in a dimensionality reduced way. Uh, and the TSNE projector uh, or the embedding projector, again, um, is again a standalone WebGL driven uh, model uh, recently improved to run TSNE on a linear time model. So it's really fast now. And you can actually uh, 
take a large sample set, these are MNIST image, you know, no example is complete without an MNIST example, no deep learning talk is complete without an MNIST talk, and this is really showing MNIST in a three-dimensional TSNE uh, mapping. And you can do the same thing for your word vectors, you can do the same thing for image vectors and start to do it. Um, right, so I want all, so I want to look at, un help people understand the data, I want people to help understand the algorithm behind it, and then eventually I want them to understand the model that's generated and how does the data and the model interact, right? So how can we do that? Um, how many are familiar with activation maps? A few, okay. Um, explainability is a hard problem in machine learning, right? The more uh, uh, complex algorithms that we do, the space to actually understand that uh, really becomes harder, right? It's really hard to translate it, right? So one of the dominant techniques these days on uh, learning about activation is optimizing for a particular image or a particular activation, right? And this is, uh, you can think of this as feature visualization. I have that image on the left of a dog and a cat. And when I look at the image, uh, I'm really looking at which neurons are really getting activated for that type of classification. So when it picks a dog, what is the neuron th that are really getting activated or what part of the image is really getting activated? So the same is for the, for the cat part. And what I want to really understand through this feature visualization is whether my image has really learned the right feature, right? Is it run the right part of the image when it's really learning, right? Uh, so there are a few uh, wonderful examples on distill.pub. If anybody doesn't know about that, they should go and look it up. On the building blocks of interpretability um, and really trying to see how we can activate this and really learn um, with different parts of the features. So now this is really important for me to communicate whether I've learned the right stuff as well as understand itself uh, if I'm trying to debug my model. Um, I'll touch on one more interaction where kind of the data model interaction becomes even more clearer. And this, I think, is a far more simpler example, but probably one of my more favorite examples in terms of explaining what's happening. Uh, many of us would, uh, would come up with models, and then uh, the models are then translated into business objectives and to see how the model different decisions that I take on the model results in. So this is like a loan classification model. Um, and I have two different types of population, blue and orange. And uh, the two histograms there, unit histograms, are really trying to show uh, the default and non-default rate for those loans. And depending on the threshold I choose, I can make some decisions around what my expected income is going to be, right? And um, this is the part that we as a data scientist would do in a notebook, right? But getting the business to then say, trying to make different decisions on these edge points, trying to take different decisions in terms of how I split it, which are all those things on the left, the strategies that I can take, I can understand what the business impact is, right? So now if my model is really running in the browser or I have the ability to at least do inference on the browser, I can try and run this and get people to understand that that model is not just a set of numbers that comes out and that's kind of the gold truth. The business translation that you do to this in terms of the strategies you take a different cutoff, and in this case the focus is really on fairness, I don't want to distinguish between two classes of people, I can make different decisions around what's happening, right? So um, I think this is really the final view of when the data model interaction actually end, reaches the end user, right? The previous one is really for me to debug much more or could potentially be used by the end user. But here I'm connecting my data science problem or the AI problem back to the business problem and really helping them to make these decisions. And that's where running stuff on the browser can potentially be interesting because I can get them to take different decisions, do inferences in real time, and help them make these judgments and not make this data science as this coders or as this separate silo that we are running where the answer comes and 
we don't, we're not able to connect it with the business, right? So this connection with the business or the user in this case is really key. And um, unfortunately, this is still very hard to do, right? This is really hard to do. Uh, if anybody has tried to create uh, communications and saying, how do I communicate my model in a way work? This is one thing that I think we really uh, struggle with in, uh, in uh, decision in uh, deep learning. And this really allows us to link it back to the business problem and say, how does it translate to what you're doing, right? Um, make sense? Questions, if any? OK, yeah? Correct. OK. So how, uh, yeah. So uh, that's a good question. So, uh, so processing power will come into two different contexts, right? So uh, OK, when I cover the next one on model inference, we can, make, we can have a discussion on what's the processing power for running the model on it in the browser. The other decision is, can I load data into my uh, model, right? Can I load data into it, and how do I do it? And that stuff is getting more and more synchronized or simplified. So there are emerging standards like uh, we have on columnar data storage on the disk, like Parkit and ORC. We have something similar coming uh, like Arrow, which is a Apache Arrow project, which is also trying to do columnar data interchangeability from any different. So if you're building a model data in Python, export it to R, export it to Scala, export it to anything. And there is JS equivalent of that, which allows me to export my data not just as a CSV or a JSON, which does not have any metadata about it, but actually in a very efficient buffer-driven way and allows me to actually play with the data and load it incrementally. And all the stuff that I do on my server-based stack, I can actually start to do it in a similar fashion. But there's obviously will be inherent limits of doing things on the browser, right? Uh, the limits of how much bandwidth you have, the pipeline you have, and you will have to make some different trade-offs in time, terms of loading the entire data or loading, even if you're loading it in buffer, can I, do I need to reduce this, right? Um, there's also visualization limit, and, but I will talk about that in the second talk that we have on architecture data visualization. Okay, so the three things that really this brings you is uh, visualization, you know, all of us use visualization libraries, but the eventual abstraction ends up writing HTML, JS, uh, or CSS if you're ending up using something on the web, no matter how you access it. So there is a possibility to do much more um, interactive stuff here. It is reactive in the way that I, people can react to it. And there is an immediacy to it, which is really hard to do when even if you have a notebook that you want somebody to start and see your visualizations, right? So, uh, building this on the browser and allowing people to engage can actually reduce that friction, right? And that's really important for many users to access this, right? Um, okay. The challenge here is it is multidisciplinary, right? Because every time I talk about this, people say, I don't really want to turn touch JavaScript or any other tool to do it. But it's not just about JavaScript. It's not really about the tool itself. It's also how do I communicate? So do I have a design? idea about it? Do I know how people interact with it? So there's a lot of interaction in terms of how people understand stuff. So when I say multidisciplinary, I'm not really saying the coding multidisciplinary, but also thinking in terms of how the end user will interact with it. How are they really trying to learn? Can I enhance their learning? And that learning is not just presenting my dry data, but also allowing them to think about what the interaction model will be, how that happens. Is the design something that they will appeal to or engage with? And that helps in democratizing, so both getting users as well as learners on board for something that is still very um, hard for most users to do, right? Okay, so how do we create? Um, some examples. Um, the easiest one is model inference, right? So that was your question. Can I load my model? Uh, so let's forget about training. I want to create things. I just want to load my model and start to use that to build this, right? So model inference is in the browser world, kind of reverses the normal equation. Instead of sending my data, which is the typical architecture that you will have, send the data to the server, 
and then comes the inference. I'm doing the reverse. I am sending the model to the browser and then doing the inference there, right? So there are issues with this that many people will raise, uh, both in terms of challenges in sending it as well as in terms of uh, privacy of my model or IP. But let's understand when you do it on the browser, you're reversing it uh, in terms of the traditional architecture of sending data. Now you're sending model to the user. So I'm really sending model to the user uh, in doing it, right? Um, so let's look at some examples, uh, both abstract and perceptual, right? Uh, so deep learning works really well for uh, perceptual stuff at the moment, less so for tabular data, abstract data. Uh, so most of the examples will be a little more perceptual. So this is <coughs> um, a sentiment analysis, a classical example of IMDB data, and as, as you type, I can actually get a sentiment analysis uh, done, and I can give that input back to the user, right? So really interesting applications. I'm doing a comment classification. As you type comment, I can basically sense whether it is going to be helpful or harmful to the, com com con to the com uh, conversation. I can flag it immediately there, give you feedback, and help you to uh, learn and change it. So if that's your domain, that you could do it, right? Um, I have two MNIST examples, OK. <laughs> the second is obviously image inferences, right? So how do I? Uh, do inference in this case is I'm just writing, and I, as I write, I can start to uh, infer what the images look like, right? Uh, bulk of the stuff in inference right now is the most uh, uh, interesting work is done in the domain of art and domain at the moment, because businesses have not really taken this that much. So uh, neural style transfer, very common example um, of taking two images and doing it. This is now becoming easier and easier to do on the browser. Um, and the second example, which is really interesting, is can I start to also do image augmentation in, in, in the browser? So if I'm training with a very small amount of data, and can I do some amount of image augmentation within uh, and start to see whether the inference is really working or not? Right? So if I make some decisions uh, on my model, uh, I can do an image augmentation in, in my browser itself and see whether the model is really performing well or not when I see the same image in a different context, right? Really important for a lot of practical business cases where we don't have the huge ImageNet data sets, but we have our small, you know, curated three class, thousand sample data points, and we want to really run this stuff on the browser, right? The second, uh, I think the, the second thing that is also underappreciated is how do we collect data, right? So how do we collect data? I mean, uh, when we're, Teaching this stuff, uh, you know, uh, downloading a data set and building a model is one challenge. But the moment you go more up on the pipeline, the fundamental problem comes, how do I collect more data from my users, right? Uh, and we need to think smartly about doing this, right? So um, yes, Mechanical Turks or crowdsourcing is one option. But how about if I have a small model and I get users to uh, give me more input, and at that time of input itself, I get them to validate whether this is right or not, right? So the quick draw data set, if anybody's played with it, which was basically scribbles as you draw, the computer is trying to guess uh, what it is, or in the reverse, how they collected the data was really to get people to make pictures of simple stuff, like a scissor or a, or a, you know, a circle or an animal, and they would guess at that point and then get you to validate it, right? The whole entire quick draw data set was basically this exercise of somebody drawing for 20 seconds, the computer guessing, and then coming to you and giving you feedback of how to do it. And I think thinking smartly about using model inference to give hints to the user to help in the process of creating or uh, validating data and augmenting my data is the real benefit of doing this. And this is what we don't think enough about when we uh, just do Kaggle problems and kind of solve the easier part, but not the upstream part of how will we get the data and validate it. And that's where model inference can really help in making this work really well. Right? Um, this is kind of self-supervised learning or semi-supervised learning, if you kind of think about this. I haven't covered more examples, but there are two specific libraries uh, built on top of TensorFlow, which is magenta.js and ml5.js, which are really focused on creative coding 
And if you want to see the exciting work on GANs and all of that, um, that's really where you should go and look at. So people who are doing stuff in music, uh, beat detection, uh, art. Uh, there's a wonderful example of somebody using TSNE on fonts data to identify which two fonts go together. So as a, as a programmer, uh, I feel like we don't really have a good sense of fonts. And we don't really understand what fonts go together, what don't go together, if we know anything beyond the standard fonts. And this is just taking font data, running it, and saying what are the two sim simple fonts that you will go together. And I am basically running a TSNE on it, finding similarity indexes, and giving you that feedback. And you can pretty much run this as part of any application. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff on the creative part, uh, which may not be the audience's lens in this conference, but if you're really keen on seeing uh, interesting stuff that eventually will trickle down to the business, then look at Magenta and ML5.js. Um, okay, so two questions there that I raised already. One is obviously data versus model privacy. Biggest problem for doing anything on the browser is, is I don't want to share my model. I spend so much time collecting my data. I spend so much time uh, fine tuning my weights. I don't want to share the weights with everyone in the world who can download it from the browser itself. So if that is your concern, there may be valid concern for not going down this path, right? I don't really want to do that. Um, there is no easy solution to it, even though the blockchain people may be thinking about some solution here, but mostly the solution is not as easy to say, how do I protect my model from somebody taking the weights? Because I am sending the weights to the browser, right? The second part is obviously how do I make the browser, the weights more effective, right? Um, so I, I need to think about sending a smaller model, and there are two things that we need to do. Quantization to make my model smaller, model size quantization. And um, how do I think about it? So there's strategies in terms of reducing the model, uh, both in terms of word embeddings and in terms of model size. So if you've done that, uh, you can then go and build easier builds for the web and mobile, right? Let's say now I have managed to convince you a bit that this is interesting enough that you want to experiment with your, and doing this in the browser itself, or experimenting and seeing what the possibilities could be. How do you do that, right? So how do we build? Um, how do we build? So how do we do that? How, is there an environment to do that? Uh, and the idea is really, can I rapidly prototype to do this? Right? Um, so I want to experiment with this, do it in an easy way. How do I go about it? So there are a few options. If you like the graphical user based, then uh, there is a model builder in Deep Learn, which was the older version of TensorFlow, where you could drag and drop and start to do it if you're not in, in that world. But I'm guessing a lot of people here would be interested in doing it using code. Um, so the other option is, can I write code immediately on my browser and run all this stuff, right? So the uh, equivalent of what we have in Jupyter Notebooks is reactive notebooks on the web is observable, which is basically allows me to access the entire JavaScript NPM e ecosystem and run this stuff on the browser in a very reactive way, right? So I'll show you one example of that. Uh, is it running? No. Okay. Uh, okay, five minutes. Yeah, mirror it. Sorry, I. I think the the stuff is not mirrored, so I'll just mirror it. Mirror. Okay, so uh, this is literally um, one example of uh, an interactive notebook running on the browser itself. Um, it is uh, basically you write code, so you can write markdown as you would, uh, and you get this. Um, but the interesting thing, for example, here is uh, I'm running a mobile net model here, uh, and I can, I can 
get an image from Unsplash, in this case just, just getting an image from Unsplash, and I'm trying to predict uh, what the classes are, right? So the very simple model inference example that you're run, running on this. There's a bit, there's very little code here just to get the image, what the image is, the value, and I'm just hitting the Unsplash API and getting the image, right? So this is just the code for the slider, uh, but maybe a little code to just boilerplate code to get the image, right? Uh, how does this really work? So as I select the image, I'm literally uh, creating this, um, I'm just using ML5.js, and to start playing with this, I just load the library, which is literally one line of code, um, load the model, mobile net classifier here, and get the predictions for that image, right? So what would be probably five lines of code also in Python or three lines of code, you're doing the same thing here. So I'm loading a model that I've, I've already trained or is pre-trained in this model, and uh, now I can actually uh, start to build a model inference just on the browser. I have not downloaded anything. Uh, the stuff is reactive. The only key difference from people who use Jupyter Notebooks is uh, there is, uh, all the cells are linked. So it's a topological order rather than a linear order. So every cell is connected to every cell. So if you update one cell, the other cells automatically get updated. So that's the key difference. But in three lines of code, I can start to now play with a deep learning model just for doing image inference, right? Um, if you're excited about this, uh, will like anything else, you can just go fork this and start to make changes on this and, and go from here and build on the same simple example and say I want to show feature visualization on, on this, how do I do that, right? And it's not really hard to do anything with the web. Uh, I'm trying to show another example on PoseNet, which has been very popular these last couple of weeks, people trying to identify uh, poses. Hmm? The internet is slow. <coughs> okay. And in this case, um, this is an image. <coughs> Roger Federer, tennis fans. These are my PoseNet points, and I can just play with the image and I'm looking at this on this, right? Now, this is the example of what I was saying. This is not created by me, but I'm just forking somebody's work and I can start to play around with it, interact it here, change it to, uh, you know, publish it, make the link applicable to everyone. Okay, um, so you can just go to observable uh, at Amit Caps and you can do it or the links will be there on the speaker deck when, when this out, you can just go and click. Um, really easy for people to start doing and creating these things and exploring these ideas of how do I build something, how do I help people learn this, how do I help people build something, how do I create it, right? So this is the one creative option to really play around with this very quickly, right? Um, if you end up going, taking it further from the browser, you can obviously use Node and take the same stuff to the server and run what runs in Python or R on the Node, uh, on Node in the server. So if you need, really need GPU access, you can use the same code. It's still under development, so you may not have custom priority with what your com custom layers, if you're using in your deep learning models or um, features that you're using in Python and C, but that will improve as the ecosystem improves, right? Um, I would suggest try out these other libraries for doing fast visualization, runtime I showed, columnar in memory if you want to look at in memory data to do that, right? Um, yeah, so way forward, um, I hope I managed to convince a few of you to go experiment with it, uh, to see the potential of how you can help people learn, how uh, help people build something, help people create something, and start yourself as a creator. Uh, and hopefully we'll have a stronger ecosystem, more libraries in this domain, and possibilities to show uh, deeper use cases once many of you have come back with that, right? Uh, hopefully many of you will come back and uh, share this with us. Um, yeah, we're at, um, two of us, we're at Amit Caps. I'm pretty much Amit Caps everywhere. 
uh, at Amit Caps on Twitter, AmitCaps.com, and Bhargav is at, at Impel or at Bhargav on your popular social media. Anyway, right? Um, Right. I mean, if you are interested in those sites, then um, if you're running it within your network, you can basically do it, right? So if you are on an HTTPS and you're using a local area to do it, then like a local network to do it, you could probably do the same thing there. So you could build applications that run within your system but are playing with this. Uh, if you want to build like production stuff, like uh, what we're doing in uh, using C APIs, uh, then it's very similar to how you access Python code. You would use the Node part of the J JavaScript e ecosystem and do the same. But then your bandwidth is really dependent on what you are comfortable as a tooling, whether you want to approach it through Python or R or uh, Node, if that's your developer ecosystem and then support it. Uh, the thing that I'm actually excited about is really uh, not having to do a lot of that stuff and get people to immediately uh, play with it and create it, uh, which is has its own challenges in the production environment or in the business environment where I think for me the biggest challenge is people don't want to share their model with the world, right? So I, would, I don't want to get the model, I want their data to come to me and that's Real world examples. Well, I'm using it to teach people how to do that. I, <laughs> these are. Right. So, um, one, we are at the early stages of deep learning. There is a very small community which really does this stuff. So, how do we reach out to a larger community to explain what we are doing and building something? That for me is not just academic in one way, but is really helping people understand what we're doing. And I'm building stuff on this. ML5.js, creative coding people are doing stuff on this. In your domain, if you say, like he's saying, in banking and production, I have more security regulations. Will I go there? Probably not. But you'll have to take a call on that. I mean, for me, this is as real world in terms of, uh, reaching out, explaining stuff, as is anything that's hidden in a Jupyter notebook and accessible to maybe a smaller set of people. Right? But your mileage may vary. Okay? Uh, thanks so much, Amit and Bhargava. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for today. Sure. If there are any questions, I'm sure they'll be around. Let's have a round of applause for both of you. Thank you. <laughs>